So, yeah, I'm here just for this week. Um, Maggie told me that I'd just be doing a small seminar, which I was thinking about five or six people. <laughs> um, but no, I'm very happy for you all to come out, and hopefully um, there's something in here which is useful or interesting. Um, so I am fr yeah, from Western Australia. Um, I grew up there, and I, I came to Oxford just to do my PhD, and then I went home again. Um, and I'm in what we call the Offshore Firm Me Mechanics Group um, in Western Australia. So. Marine energy, like tidal energy, still fits within this group, but in Australia the demand for tidal energy is a lot lower. Um, mainly we're resource rich, and so we've got a short term, short -term expectations to get. We don't look into the future very far in Australia, so, so unfortunately tidal energy is not a big research topic in Australia. Um, so just to let you know where Australia is, I'm sure you all know <laughs> the place. So down here, um, I'm from Perth, which is the western side. Um, this is our map of Australia here, so right down the bottom left. Um, if we zoom in on that, this is the suburban area of Perth. Uh, if any of you have been there, you'll know the Swan River is our main sort of geographic feature. Um, Perth is sort of 10, 15 kilometres from the beach, which runs on the left there. Um, and the University of Western Australia, where I'm from, is on the river here, Matilda Bay um, region. Uh, if you look from this side, from, from your left, uh, down, this is what it looks like. So, this is UWA. Um, the engineering building is sort of around here, and we can look over, and that's the first sort of skyline. So, just to give you a bit of context, uh, Western Australia has about 2 million people. Um, we're resource rich, so we do a lot of mining. Iron ore is the key thing. Iron ore here being mined from stockpiles. That's mined all through the north of the state. Um, the other thing we're well known for is, is offshore oil and gas, and specifically gas. So most of my work is actually to support operations like this, hopefully make them more efficient. So still trying to sort of work the angle of reducing our dependency on, on burning a lot of fossil fuels. Um, and most of that happens in the north of our, our state up here. Um, and also we're in the Bass Strait here too. Um, we have huge uh, sites. So a lot of the work I do is, is trying to understand uh, the extreme loads on structures and then particularly on pipelines when those cyclones come through. Um, we're also well known for tourism uh, sharks. These are good sharks, these are whale sharks. We also have lots of shark attacks as well, so you have to be careful. Um, and a few other things you can see. Maggie would have seen both of those two at the bottom when she did. Alright, so that's the context. Um, so today's talk, I was going to go through a, through a few things, which are basically, it's just work that I did in my PhD, and then I ended up doing a PhD. Um, and at the very end of this talk, I'll explain to you why I'm still interested in this type of actuated disk modelling, um, because it does have application to offshore structures. Um, so today's talk, a bit of background, and I'll sort of set up the problem that I wanted to look at. Um, I'll go through some existing theoretical models, starting out with a, a model to look at a single turbine by itself, then a model to look at an infinitely long row of turbines, um, then a finite row of turbines. And then I'll introduce something a bit new, which is trying to get us from a single turbine to now turbines, so more than one row. Some general conclusions come from this work, which are quite interesting. Um, and recent numerical models, um, these are all Reynolds Average Navi Stokes models, but three dimensional, seem to agree quite well with the theory. So I thought I'd present that at the end. And then some sort of final final remarks. So that's the, I guess, the layout of the talk. Okay, so the background. Um, turbines, where can we put turbines? Well, I think you all know really well where we can put turbines. We can put them in 
locations where we have large tides. Um, the water level goes up and down so much, we know that to get the water level up, we must have a, a lot of water rushing in. And so associated with that, we often have locations with fast currents. Um, and usually we can see them just when we see coherent structures on the top of the water surface. Um, or if we're in a boat and we can float past uh, with the tide. Um, wind, well known, and I was, I was talking to Angus uh, on Monday, and he showed me his impressive CFD simulation of this situation. So we can obviously have turbines uh, in, in wind fluid, or fluid air, sorry, and ocean currents. And in Australia, this current runs down the east of the, of the country, and there has been some debate about whether or not we could stick turbines in that ocean current. The peak velocities are less than a metre per second, so if we do it, we need turbines that are going to work well at much lower velocities than we talk about uh, for tidal races around Scotland. So they're the different locations we can put them in. And today I'm just going to try and think about a basic problem, one where we have a uniform flow that's steady. We have a bunch of turbines, so these little grey things are turbines. And the question is, um, what is the optimum way to arrange these end turbines in this unit flow to maximise the power we can take out? Now this simple problem, we're just going to treat the flow as being from the same direction the whole time, or perhaps bi-directional, so it can go backwards as well. Now that's perhaps a good idea for tidal, because tidal currents, they can in some areas be, I guess, backwards and forwards. For wind, we know there's a bit more spreading in the direction the wind comes from, so the wind could be changing direction, and that will have a big effect on how we arrange turbines. Um, and I'll probably talk about that a bit more in the question time, but if we had a site where we had simply uniform mean wind direction, the mean wind direction didn't change much, then this work would be sort of appropriate for that too. Okay, so that's our game, well that's, our, that's what we want to do, we want to try and figure out how to optimise turbines. So what existing theoretical models are available? Well firstly, let's just think about a single turbine, I'm sure many of you know about this theory. Um, a real turbine, horizontal axis turbine, three blades, um, flow structure around those blades is really complicated, uh, we still can't really model that properly, um, functionally. we can't get that right. But one of the early approximations for this type of device was to say, let's replace all of the complicated flow structure around the blades. Let's introduce a porous disc with a uniform resistance, which has the same swept area as the turbine blades. And let's just say that this uniform disc has some resistance so that it slows the velocity passing through the disc to some fraction alpha 2 times the free strain velocity. And we can think of that alpha 2 as being a function of the number of turbine blades. If we have lots of blades, we basically create a large bridge. Alpha 2 would be quite small. Um, if we had very few blades, then alpha 2 would be larger. It's also dependent on how fast we're spinning those blades around. And it's dependent on things like the blade shape as well. So there's some nice theories. Many of you will know um, blade element theory, which allows us to sort of do this relationship. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. I'm just going to assume we've got these simple disks which have just alpha 2 to prescribe how they operate. So if we take that simple model, um, it's well known, it goes back to the 1915-1920. We can take it looking from the side now. It's got a uniform resistance. We'll introduce this force T to represent that. And the question is, when we have this uniform flow, our reference power really is the power passing through an upstream region the same swept area as the disk, um, and the power coming through that is half rho u cubed times a. So the question is, um, for this single turbine, how much of that reference power can we take out? And all we're going to assume really is that <coughs> we can divide up the region where the flow goes through the turbine, the flow goes around the turbine. If we do that, we can apply mass, momentum and energy principles. Um, we can start to define, for example, therefore, from mass conservation, what the area here would be relative to the area upstream. And if we run through the maths, um, we find that the power that this turbine can remove, uh, normalised by that reference power, turns out to be only dependent on that alpha 2 parameter, which is defining our resistance. And if we optimise this expression for alpha 2, we work out that the maximum power we can remove is this fraction 16 over 27 times that reference. And you, many of you will know that's the, uh, that ratio is famous. It's the Betts limit. Probably should be called the Lanchester Betts limit or, or there's other people that have claim to that too. So that's the simple result for a single, tur for a single turbine. That's how much power we can remove. 
Okay, so what happens if we have a, an infinitely long row of turbines? So many of these things going up off the page both ways. Can we work out how much power these will get? Well, you'd think the power would be higher because this particular turbine, it's got turbines next to it which stop the flow from going around it. They sort of act as resistance to make more of the flow funnel through this turbine. So we can just use simple arguments <coughs> of symmetry. Uh, we can say, well, here's our one turbine. We've got symmetry boundaries on the side. So we can think of this as a disk in a tube or a disk in a, in a region with fixed volume. Um, <coughs> and we can do exactly the same theory for a single turbine. The only additional parameter that enters the problem is what we could call our geometric blockage ratio. So the geometric blockage ratio is effectively the area or the length of this turbine um, divided by the area or the width of this finite flow. And that's the only extra parameter that comes into the problem. We can set the problem up exactly the same as before. Um, use mass, momentum and energy conservation. And we work out this time that the maximum power is almost the same, but it has a, an additional correction factor that involves that geometric blockage ratio. So if we let our geometric blockage ratio go to zero, we'd be back to a single turbine. That all makes sense. We get back to 16 over 27. As we blockage ratio increase from zero, this, uh, this um, coefficient increases, and so we get more power. So that makes sense, and that's a simple model for an infinitely long row of turbines. It's all analytical, but it does agree with numerical simulation. So this is some work that Takafumi did in Oxford um, just after I left, actually. And he put a, put a porous disk into um, a fluent model in three dimensions. Um, and he basically explored different geometric blockage ratios in confined volumes. They're not really um, the same shape as the disk and not necessarily square. So he looked at different aspect ratios. And in all cases that he studied, um, <coughs> in this plot here, we've got a range of different cases where he's plotting the power coefficient, CP. That's the power divided by that reference power. Um, against here, alpha. So this would be the alpha two value, which I talked about before. And you can see the black lines are the predictions from the theoretical model. And the red dots here are the results from the numerical model. So it works quite well um, in all cases. Okay, so that's an infinitely long row. Now we want to go towards the case of a finite row that's not infinitely long. What do we think now? We know we'd probably expect a bit less power now than what we'd get for an infinitely long row. Because perhaps this turbine knows, or this fence as a whole, we call this a fence of turbines, flow can divert the fence on a large scale. So we'd expect there might be a bit less power. So how can we treat this case? And it turns out we can use a really neat idea, which is an idea of scale separation. And that is to think of the array of turbines itself as one single big porous disk. And so at that array scale, we have one of our actuator disk problems, where we have an alpha two now that's at the array scale defining the velocity passing through the fence as a whole. And then embedded within that, we have a second smaller scale, which is an individual turbines. And those individual turbines are also a single actuated disk problem. They have an upstream velocity given by the array scale. And so the velocity passing through the disk is just the product of the array alpha two and the alpha two for the local turbine. This problem is completely uh, well-defined and you can solve it. Now the maximum power we can get is, not, is now a function of the blockage ratio again. And we talk about the local blockage ratio now, just the local blockage of these turbines within the fence. So we can obtain that relationship. The only trick is we can't get it as simple as we got it before. And so this is a plot of the maximum power, um, or CP max, the maximum power normalized by that reference <coughs> And what we've got on the bottom here is as we vary the local blockage, we find that there is an optimum point. It turns out that you want your individual turbines to have a local blockage of about 0.4. And if you do that, you get the maximum power. The idea is if your local blockage was much less than that, so the turbines are really well spaced out, you effectively get no benefit of, of the grouping of turbines. 
And if your local blockage was much higher, the, the fence as a whole becomes too solid and most of the flow goes around the whole fence. So there's a bit of a sweet spot in between and that's this, this optimum power here. So that's a really nice result um, and that's the existing work. We've gone through single turbine, <coughs> infinite row and a finite row and all the time we've been able to get some results for a maximum amount of power based on simply a blockage ratio. Okay, so the problem is though, we've only dealt with, dealt with one row or one turbine at the moment, and so we can't really argue that we've fully understood how to optimise an array of turbines. So I'm going to introduce this new concept, which is let's start looking at centred and staggered turbines, multiple rows rather than one row. The reason we want to do that is because with those three existing sort of theories I've explained to you, what we can do is we can handle layouts like this, Perhaps so we have a tidal channel and we have discrete rows of turbines. Those discrete rows are, are very well spaced, so we allow for complete mixing after the row. So we've got uniform flow here, we've got some weights, mix it out, uniform flow again, and that way we can apply the simple one row model. And that's been done several times. Uh, Ross Fennell in New Zealand has done that really well for different channels. And with those existing theories, we can also do this case, which is a finite row, which is what I just showed you. Um, and Takafumi's done lots of work on that. But with those models, we can't do these cases yet. We can't do situations where we have two rows of turbines that are too close, that we don't allow complete mixing in between. Hence, we don't have uniform flow in between. We can't do situations where we have staggered turbines. And we might think, you know, why are we doing this? Well, we would think intuitively that if I have these two turbines here, the flow that passes through between them must increase due to <coughs> conservation of mass. So we're going to get this funneling effect. So it makes sense that perhaps we want to stick some turbines staggered back to take advantage of that funneling. Problem is though, with those existing theories we can't treat this yet, so not possible yet. Um, again, we could take that staggering to an unbounded flow case. So we have local turbines staggered like this. With existing theories, we can't treat that yet. Um, and also, if we had two large-scale finite rows, where perhaps we've got mixing at the local scale, but at the array scale, we haven't got enough separation for mixing. And we can't actually handle this case either with those existing theories. So <coughs> when we came up with this idea of centred and staggered turbines, we wanted to be able to try and handle these new cases, which we think are practically relevant and important. Okay, so to do that, we go with that same model, that same simple actuated disk model. We're going to solve it in the finite flow. <coughs> and all we're going to do is we're just going to look at a turbine we're going to place downstream. So we've got a turbine upstream to the left, and then downstream we've got a second disk here or, or turbine. So off the front turbine, we have this weight flow region where we have a slower velocity coming through the, the disk and we have this bypass region where we have faster flow and that will give us some kind of step velocity profile like this sort of a top hat or inverse top hat profile and we can stick the second turbine downstream the only assumption we have to make is that the spacing, the downstream spacing between these turbines is sufficient for two things one, that we've had pressure equalisation across the flow so our streamlines are no longer still expanding, they've sort of leveled off and they're all parallel with each other. And the second thing we require <coughs> is that the spacing between the turbines is not too big that we've had mixing starting to occur. And if mixing starts to occur, then we don't have this nice two profile anymore. We have something that's smeared out, sheared out, a bit different. So we've got this intermediate spacing, that's the only constriction. Otherwise, we've got two turbines now, one in this case, directly behind the other turbine, so this would be the centred configuration. Okay, um, there's a bit of maths here, I'm just going to skip this actually, because if anybody's interested I can go through this. Um, this is just the solution to the extended problem, it's nice, it's quite interesting, but um, if I skip these... Okay, and we get to some results. So with that extended model, there's no problem, we can extend it easily. And what we're gonna do now is just explore what happens as an example case when we have two disks, one behind the other. And these disks, we would usually use alpha two, 
to describe them. I'm now going to use this thing I'm going to call K. K is pretty similar to alpha 2. It's not exactly the same, but I'm going to use K just because uh, it's a bit more physical. Um, and we have a K here too. So this is an example of solutions for two particular geometric blockage ratios. The one on the left is B equal to 0, so unblocked. There's no side boundaries, they're miles away. And the one on the right here is for something a bit more blocked, blockage of 0.5. What these plots are is their contours of our power coefficient CP as a function of the two different local resistances, K1 and K2. So what we find is that when we have two turbines, one behind the other, if we're free to let K1 and K2 be any values we like, it turns out that the best situation in an unblocked flow would be to have K1 equal to 1 and K2 equal to 2. That means we should have the front turbine being less resistant or more porous than the back turbine. The back turbine should be more resistant. So it's no longer a symmetric solution. The optimum situation now is for your two turbines to have different resistances. However, if we were to make them have the same resistance, and why would we want them to have the same resistance? Well, because if this is a tidal flow, the flow will go this way, and then it will reverse. And so we don't really want uh, our uh, turbines to work really well in one direction and not in the other direction. So we want, maybe want to constrain them to have the same K values. If we do that, we're on this sort of dashed line here, and we have an optimum here, subject to that constraint. And these contours are actually normalised by the maximum CP. So you can see the reduction in power we get by enforcing them to have the same K is only 1%. So although the solution is no longer symmetric, it's pretty close. The optimum is pretty close to having symmetric resistances, which is quite interesting. It's quite a good result. Um, as the blockage ratio increases, the story is not as good, but it's still pretty good. Um, again, the downstream turbine should have a much larger resistance, so this time 60, versus the, uh, the upstream turbine, which is between 5 and 10. Um, if we constrain them to have the same resistance, our local maximum is over here, um, but that's lying on the 95% contour line. So we get a 5% reduction in power, a higher blockage, um, if we enforce the turbines to have the same resistance. So this is quite nice, we're just dealing with two turbines now, centred. We're thinking about optimising power and we're looking at um, how we can play around with the different resistances to see how that affects power. But we do want to start thinking about, okay, if I've got two turbines, we don't just want to think about how we can change their resistance, we also want to think about maybe how we want to place them. So there's three really simple scenarios we can think of. We can go First of all, with our new model, where the distance between the turbines is just right to not have mixing, but not too close for the pressure to have not equalised. We have a situation here where we put them really far away from each other, so we have complete mixing in between. We just apply the simple single turbine model twice. And we can also have the case where we basically put them on top of each other, right next to each other. And basically in this case, they just behave like a, a single turbine except you've got two of them there at once, okay? And so we can use the, uh, the simple single turbine model for that case as well. So these three cases, we can now compare them with this new model. And if we do that, we can start plotting uh, maximum CP as a function of blockage. And in this case, we're allowing our K values to be whatever we like. They, can, they don't have to be the same, they can be different. And so this tells us what the maximum power is for scenario C. We're up here and we get quite a lot of power out when we have them separated very far apart. The amount of power we can get there is 16 over 27, which is what we expect based on the BETS limit, when our blockage ratio is zero. And as our blockage ratio increases, we can get more power out because of the blockage effect. When we put our two turbines sort of intermediate spacing, we're on this line B, so we actually get less power when we have two turbines in intermediate spacing. Why is that? Because this turbine is in the wake of that turbine. In this case, we've allowed complete mixing to occur. So the velocity that this turbine sees is higher than the velocity that this turbine would see in the wake. Does that make sense? We get less power when we're 
too close together in a centered arrangement. And when we put them really close together, we end up getting a bit less power than when they're a bit spread out. It's probably hard to understand why that might be the case, but it turns out that's just a bit different. And uh, it's actually quite nice and convenient for our conclusions that come up a bit later. So we sort of rank these different configurations just using this new extended actuators model. And if we made K1 equal to K2, it would plot as this red dashed line in this curve. So it's a little bit less than the black line, which is what we saw. We're only on the 99 or 95% contour lines. The difference gets a bit bigger at large blockage, but it's pretty close. So we don't lose a lot by making them symmetric and making them the same resistance. Okay, so that's the centered case. Can we do the staggered case? And the answer is yes, we can. It's exactly the same model, except instead of sticking our downstream turbine in the weight of the upstream turbine, we now stick it in the bypass flow. And we have exactly the same assumption on the downstream spacing as we did for the centered disk. And so the maths is all pretty much the same. We can look at another example case. Um, and again, we've got K1 up the front here and K2 at the back. These look like they've been chopped in half, but I'm just pretending we have an infinitely long row of staggered turbines, and I'm just using a, a symmetry condition that cuts through both of them. So what happens when we have the staggered arrangement? Uh, we can again, we're looking at two different blockage ratios. Uh, for the zero blockage, what happens is, if we uh, have K1 equal to K2, that actually turns out to be our optimum scenario for zero blockage. So the best situation for zero blockage is actually to have the same K values. Why is that the case? Well, the reason that's the case is if we have a very large, very small blockage, it means that these walls or these turbines are very far apart. It means the bypass flow that goes around the first turbine is basically unchanged. It doesn't change because the, uh, the width of the channel is so large relative to the front turbine. And so the back turbine is behaving exactly like the front turbine would. Both of them see the same velocity, hence both of them, we're just optimising both of them at the same time. Perfectly symmetric problem, and uh, the optimum is when they both have the same resistance. As soon as we start to increase the, the blockage ratio, things change. So now this is a plot where we have K1, so the resistance of the upstream turbine, and K2, which is the resistance of the downstream turbine. Our maximum now occurs over here, which says when we have staggered turbines, the best thing to do is to have the front turbine be very non-porous or impermeable, so it's got more resistance, and to have the downstream turbine less resistant. What's that mean? Well, it means what's happening here is you basically want your upstream turbine to act like a brick wall, just a big brick wall that funnels the flow past it really fast, and so the downstream turbine can make use of that funnel flow. That's sort of what that solution is saying. So if we were to constrain ourselves and say, well, let's just make K1 equal to K2, we're going to get a bit less power. Um, and we lie on this line. This is our local maxima. But again, we're still not a lot less. We're really 5% less. So it's not a bad result. It's quite interesting. And that's for, for staggered turbines. We can now do the same thing we did for centred, and we can say, well, there's our new model here. And we've got these staggered turbines. What else could we do? Well, we could bring them in the same plane, like this. So we've just got a single row of turbines which are spaced together. Or we could separate them really far apart. And if we separate them really far apart, we allow complete mixing in between them. So here we can apply the single turbine model twice. Here we can apply the single turbine model with twice the blockage ratio. And here we've got our new model for staggering between. And if we do that, this is what turns out to be the case. Um, we've got CP max on the vertical axis. We've got blockage here on the horizontal axis. Turns out now that A, when we put them in the same plane, is almost greater than staggering over the blockage ratio range slightly lower for small blockage. That means it's slightly better to stagger the turbines like this than it is to put them in a row for small blockage. As soon as the blockage gets large, it's much better to have the turbines all in the same plane. 
But what that means is it means the blockage effect, having twice that blockage, is more beneficial than the funneling effect which you get from staggering turbines when the blockage gets large. And C out here would be separating far apart is much less because we don't have any blockage and we don't have any funneling effects. So we expect that to be a lot worse. I think that's the main thing from this slide. This is looking at how the different resistances vary as well. But okay. If we make them symmetric, if we make K1 and K2 the same, <coughs> same, then this red dash line becomes our ma maximum power line. That's lower than when we had them unconstrained. And uh, it's much lower than when we have them in the same plane. So that means if our turbines are all the same, we will be producing much less power when we stagger them than what we can do when they're in the same plane. Okay? So actually that back here, that's meant to be 0 0.05, not 0.5. Jenny pick, pick that up. So 0 0.05 is down here. And it's still quite similar. Right. So what does all that mean? Um, well, we can come up with some general conclusions now for arrangements of sort of turbines. I'm going to claim we can. Because um, what we've seen is that when we have turbines, number one here, when all the turbines are the same, they all have the same resistance, we know number one beats number two for all blockage ratios. And we know number two beats number three, because number three has no blockage effects or benefits, less blockage benefits and no benefits from that yet. But we also know that number three is exactly the same as this type of number three because both of them have complete mixing in between. So the location of the downstream turbine doesn't matter. And we know number three beats number four, which was two of them in between. And we know that number four just beats number five, which is two of them together. So we sort of have a, a hierarchy now of how we would arrange turbines if they all had the same K value. We should always try and put them in the same plane get big blockage ratios, as big as we can. That's better than staggering. It's better than putting them far apart and allowing complete mixing. Okay, so now we can go back to the problem which we wanted to look at at the start, which is just arrangements of turbines in a uniform <coughs> flow. We can think about, say, a few turbines staggered. And we can analyse this problem easily with our new model. What we can do is exploit that scale separation again. We now have this local fence here, which is like our single single array actuator disk, and we have separation at that larger scale. So we have a sorry, a single disk solution at that larger scale. And if we look at a smaller scale, we have our simple problem here of our staggered turbines embedded within that. So it's really easy for us to, to just extend this solution. Um, and when we do that, we end up with this solution here. So this is the case we had when we have one fence and we stick all of the turbines in a row, so we get very large local blockage. This is the case when we take the same number of turbines but stagger them. And what we're looking at now is what this local blockage ratio, how we tune the spacing laterally between the turbines to get the maximum power. For the stagger case, we have a, a similar looking curve. If we stagger the turbines and put them too close to each other, flow goes around the whole array of turbines. If we separate them out too much, it's like all the turbines are behaving individually. There's a sweet spot in the middle. Turns out it's pretty similar to that for one fence, except the power you get out is less. So much less actually, on the order of over 10% or so less. So when we're in an unbounded flow, sticking all your turbines side by side is better than staggering them as well. So that's interesting, obviously an interesting conclusion. We can also go ahead with our new model and treat arrays like this. So we now have a row of turbines upstream, a row of turbines downstream. Uh, what we can do is at the local scale, we just have our single, single actuated disk solution in a blocked flow, both cases. But for the flow as a whole, we basically have two actuated disks centered. So we're just sort of using our new model in the centred case now for the array scale. And we can solve that. Um, this is what the solution turns out to be. This red line here. Um, we've got a solution, two other, three other lines plotted here. 
the black line is through, we put all the turbines in one fence. Um, and these two dashed lines, this is the uh, front fence and this is the back fence, how much power they get out. The front fence always gets more power out, as you would expect. What's it mean? Well, it means, again, there is an optimum blockage, local blockage ratio when we have two fences of turbines. Well, that optimum local blockage is much smaller than what it was when we have one row of turbines. The reason for that is that when we have two rows, if we space the upstream row the same as what we would do when we have one row by itself, the downstream fence of turbines would get no power. So that means we sort of have to start spacing all of our turbines out more and more as we introduce another row. If we introduce a third row, the optimum would actually go towards having almost a zero blockage ratio. So, uh, so that's the solutions you get when you have two, two uh, fences of turbines. Okay, so I said that that's all theoretical. Um, we were replacing disc turbines with actuated discs. How does this compare with reality? We don't know. Um, how does it compare with numerical models, which are maybe one step closer to reality, maybe? Well, it compares quite well. So, um, some work was done uh, by Will Hunter at Oxford with Takafumi and with Richard Wilden um, a couple of years ago, but they only published it this year. And they did 3D uh, range simulations where they had a bunch of turbines in a single line, so they're all in the same line. They then staggered them and then they staggered them some more with a bigger offset. And they used this uh, psi here to, to, to describe how big an offset they had in the staggered rows. And what they found was that if you plot that staggering distance here, normalised by the diameter of the disk, and on this axis is actually their maximum CP, as you start to, when, when this psi is zero, it means you've got all the turbines in the same plane, and as psi increases, you have them more and more staggered. And they find that the overall power coefficient drops continuously as you do that, which is in perfect agreement with this model, um, which is quite good. Um, and they're not the only people that have found this result. Um, some early work as well has got the same trends. So this suggests that staggering turbines is not as good as you might initially think. It's much better to try and get big blockage and put them all in the same line, the turbines. Okay, so that's the, the main thing. Just some final remarks. Um, so what we've shown from these sort of models is that if all turbines are identical, have the same resistance, it appears that the best arrangement is to place them in a single line side by side. Uh, turbines do not have the same, if they do not have the same resistance, then there may be some benefit from staggering them, but it might be really, really hard to exploit that because it's going to be for only a certain blockage ratio range. Um, the results appear to agree very well with recent uh, 3D, sorry, 3D CFD simulations. And the theory presented here for arrangements of turbines may be applicable to calculating forces on space frame structures such as jack-up platforms. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean this. So I've got about three slides to finish, and this Three slides are important for me because it's what I do now, um, how I use this same theory in offshore engineering um, in Australia. This is a very famous uh, sort of problem, and Paul Taylor from Oxford sort of started this work, if you know Paul. If I have a jack-up structure, it's made up of a lattice of structural members. So the structure as a whole is like a porous structure. Water can flow through it, straight through the structure. Here's a picture of it. Water can flow through it and can flow around it. So to first approximation, it's the same as our actuated disc with a turbine with blades spinning. Air can flow or water can flow through the turbine or it has to flow around the turbine. <coughs> so if I looked uh, from above, here's the outline of our space frame structure. The flow would do this, it would divert around the structure, just like what we saw for our single actuated disc problem. And so I could, to first approximation, take this structure and just replace it with a single actuated disc. And that's what Paul did back in the early 1990s. And he was able to work out what the velocity through the structure would be for a given arrangement of members. And therefore we could work out that the velocity passing through the structure was less than the velocity upstream, 
which means if you're designing these structural members, you can use a lower force than what you would do if you were just using the free stream. And oil and gas companies love that because it means cheaper structures, smaller loads on the structures. And this is all in the uh, a range of different offshore design codes that you would have to use if you were designing these structures. Here's uh, some field data for the full input platform. That's the uh, footprint of it there, so we're looking down at it in plan. I had a few different ADVs. And you can see that you've got to be probably a little bit uh, creative with your interpretation, but it's definitely sort of expanding or diverging as the flow comes around, around this structure. So it does look like the theory is doing a reasonably good job to first approximation. So how does that tie into what I just told you about centered and staggered turbines? Well, a big class of offshore structure what we call jack-ups, and this is a jack-up. If you've gone up to Aberdeen, you would know this um, really well. Jack-ups usually have three lengths, sometimes four, but often three because it's a bit more stable. Um, three lengths, um, all of the lengths are made up of structural members, they're all these porous structures. And uh, we have to think about the loads on these too because jack-ups can be hit by cyclones and so forth and we want them to stay stationary and not to topple over. So if you look at these three-legged and four-legged in plan, that's what they look like. And we could just replace these with actuated discs too. And if we do that, three-legged becomes staggered under this particular current direction and four-legged becomes centred under this particular current direction. So. Uh, at the moment, we're in the process of extending these actuated disc models to try and pick up force reductions for jack-up lengths for jack-up platforms. Um, so that's it. Uh, offshore engineering at UWA is good, very good. Um, and we've just got some funding because Shell is currently expanding in Western Australia. So if there's any PhD students that are finishing, um, we'll advertise some, a couple of postdoc positions um, in the next couple of months. And if you have any undergrads that want to do PhDs but want to go to the different Perth, not in Scotland but in Australia, um, look at that too because we will we'll be employing people. So um, that's the end of, uh, of my talk. <coughs> Thank you. too much. I mean, we want to just take out... I mean, most of, the, um, most of the numerical results we get from these models, we're probably not interested in. We're more interested in the trends we get out. So, i.e., staggered looks better than centred, as opposed to exactly how much power we get from staggered. But uh, in terms of introducing a non-uniform flow, you can definitely do that in terms of the actuated disk model. Um, and there's different ways you can do that. It hasn't ever been done before properly, actually. But uh, it's a really good question. I mean, maybe we can talk about it afterwards. We... We actually have been doing this work with Tom Aycock um, at Oxford, specifically because those offshore structures don't see uniform flows, they actually see sheared flows. Um, so as long as we ignore turbulence, info turbulence, and just look at the shear, so an inviscid shear, we can do it with these models. I think if we start worrying about weights, I think you were asking about weights, non-uniform, I think we go a bit beyond the realm of this, this simple modeling. Um, so we need a better way to do that. Yeah. That's good. Yep. So that's a really good question. So the power coefficient, um, now we wouldn't probably call it 
and efficiency if we're thinking about the total amount of power available in a flow. And the reason why is because as soon as we put flow confinement on, we immediately get a pressure gradient just due to the turbine's presence. We get a pressure gradient in the streamwise direction. That pressure gradient gives us a bit more power potential than just the kinetic flux flowing through the channel. And so the available power is now increasing. That's why our CPs go up above the BETS limit, because of that additional power. And we've got people, I mean, Stephen Salter sort of was, spoke about that a bit before. Um, so yeah, so we wouldn't call CP in a perfect efficiency measure, but still a useful, useful metric to think about, because that is real power, that pressure gradient. So if the CP goes up, it means our real power potential does go up. Um, we can think about different metrics, though, to get a better capture of efficiency. And some, some work's been done on that, so. Sorry, is there a measure of efficiency? Yeah, there is. So, so usually we would define efficiency as being the kinetic flux coming through, plus the change in pressure we get across the, across the uh, channel. We take that as our total power in the channel, and we then take our extracted power and divide it by that. That's what we would call an efficiency. So I've written some papers where I define that as efficiency, and there's a few other people who have sort of used that too. When you go and stick these, these arrangements into a real tidal channel where there's a finite amount of power, it's very important that you use the efficiency to think about available power. So I think that term, term used available power is definitely something that's sort of defined well in the literature. And it's all about accounting for the fact that you know, when we've got a turbine in, or when we've got a real channel, we've got a pressure gradient. So there is some more power to get. So let's think about what fraction of the total power we can actually remove. Um, no, it applies for it, well, it applies only applies for a flow where you can get a pressure gradient across the, the flow. So it has to have flow confinement. It doesn't have to be an open channel flow. So it's just a pressure gradient. That could be a head, or it could just be a pressure head or an elevation head. Either of them work. It's just the flow confinement's required to do that. So yes, yeah, so people have looked a lot at, at scour around boat uh, propellers, and looking at, at that already, and you definitely get scour because of the effect of propellers. Mm -hmm. The same thing would happen with an ar array of tidal turbines. You would definitely, I think, get more scour occurring in the in the bypass regions. Um, one thing to note, though, is a lot of these turbines will go in fast-moving flows. So some great pictures of the bottom of the uh, of the Pentland Firth that, that Stephen Solver showed, and they're usually just rock because. The flows, the idea is the flows are too fast and they take all the sediment away. Um, it's not true everywhere. I mean, there's places if we, we want to go to a headland site like the Portland Bill at the bottom of the UK is a great example. That's got lots of sediment. And we know there's some fantastic dynamics of sediment transport around headlands. Um, and turbines will disrupt that, not just on the local scale, so scale between turbines, but also on a larger scale. The momentum sink, I guess, of the or the energy sink of the array can have a big impact, I think, on the on the morphology of that region you know, at a larger scale. So it's a really good question. Um, and there's some, some work been done on that already. Um, so I can t sort of talk about that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's definitely some work done on the regional scale effects already. So zero. So I've uh, said that the best thing to do is put them all in the same plane. So we don't stagger them at all. What I mean, if, if you have like an array, so you have like several rows, so what would be the optimum distance between the first combine uh, from the first row to the second row? So I would say the best thing to do is to not have rows. I see. Can, right. To put them all in a big long line. But now it's quite impossible if the space is limited, right? So, so if the space is limited and we're in a channel, then I would put the second row sufficiently far downstream that we've had complete mixing, if that's possible, um, in between them. So we're getting a uniform flow hitting the second row as well. But how far is that distance? I don't know. It sort of depends on a number of things. Depends how quickly the wake mixes out. Depends on ambient turbulence. 
depends on turbines produced by the turbines, which is not in this model. We can't tell that unless we do something a bit more clever. Yeah. That's a really good question because obviously you need to know, to know that. Yep. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any intention to do any experimental work to validate this, or indeed whether any of the stuff like the parallel work has got any useful data you can use to compare? Um, I don't really know a lot about the parallel work because I was only involved in a little part, so I think it's a lot that I don't know about. But um, I don't know of any experiments. Well, there have been some experiments to look at two staggered turbines. I think Southampton have done some work on that. Um, from what I've seen, everything seems to agree with this, you know, qualitatively. So the trends are right. I mean, quantitatively, it's going to be different. But um, no, I don't know of anybody doing anything specific. You know, it'd be good if somebody did because it would be cool to, to verify this in actual turbines yeah. um, or model scale turbines would be good too. Yeah. I thought Manchester had done some layout stuff that was part of that. Yeah, so Manchester have been, and Susanna Cook has been doing some work on, but I think she's been doing one row only, just looking at the finite row and varying the spacing. So looking at the th one of the previous bits of work that the Takafumi Machino did. Yeah. But I don't know if she's staggered them. Uh, do you know if she has? I don't know. No, okay, so I don't know. Yeah. I'm going there next week so I can find out if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to ask him. Yep. Hi, um, my previous role before I started here was in uh, offshore wind projects yep. and uh, actually people were putting hundreds of millions of euros, billions of euros yep. at these projects. So you said it was kind of, we don't know. Mm. I disagree with that because there's loads of people who know. Um, they're already building wind farms onshore and offshore. Yep. Um, and it does seem to me that there is operational data out there which you probably can't actually get access to because yep. people are very quiet about that. Yeah. Uh, they don't like to share that sort of information. But there must be some way that you can yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. tie this kind of work back into the real world where so motor diameters of seven yeah. standwise and nine downstream are kind yeah. of taken as yep. this rules of thumb. So. That's right. I mean, y and you're correct. We probably should definitely look at that and see what we can get out of it. I mean, there is a, a subtle thing with wind. They tend to be more spaced out in that lateral direction just because the wind can come from different directions. So, but, but I agree with you, actually. If you do know data, I'd, I'd love to, to have a look at it. When I say I don't know, I probably should say I don't know, not we don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Well, I should give you Shona Robert, Shona's address in Screw Energy in Glasgow because that's what we do. Okay, um, okay. But just to give an example, I was involved in a project that was 83 megawatt wind turbines in an yep. array. Yep. And uh, for various reasons of simplicity in terms of the cost of the cable and cable losses, yeah. they're often laid out just in a grid. Yeah, okay. So in that particular one, they want to just try and mix it up a bit yeah. and deal with the fact that there's predominant wind directions, but actually quite a lot of variability, as you said. Yeah. And by making the, the, the uh, park higgledy-piggledy, -higgledy, they could reduce that 80 to 77. Yeah. And Still get the same. No, they got 12% more energy out because they reduced okay. to 77 but higgledy piggledy yeah. and that's after accounting for the extra capital cost of yep. more cables and the losses in longer cables on some lengths yeah, okay. of the okay. so and that was three year, three and a half years ago I left that so yeah. it's been done and it's out yeah, there yeah, yeah. But it, okay. it's, it's a no that's very good I mean if you maybe I'll ask you afterwards for the name and I'll try yeah. and check it out yeah, thank you happy to share Yeah. Okay, um, no, any, anyone, anyone question? Yeah. Sorry. Second question is, um, yeah. I understand that the case, uh, the first mm. of an indicator of the resistance put in practice, how else would it be to control the turbine for assembly supply side resistance and as, as, as a rule? Uh, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, depends on, on the turbine, I think. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know actually how easy it would be to control a turbine to keep its resistance as you want. It's all about making, you can do a couple of things. You can change the uh, pitch of the blades or you can spin it at a different rate. Um, but I'm not an expert on, on actually that. Um, so it could be hard. That's why I said that, that staggering, you know, you could get some benefit from staggering if you allow the resistances to be different. But I think it's pretty hard to achieve that from the people who spoke to if they don't think they can. But I'm not an expert, so, so I don't really know, to be honest. Yeah. What's uh, what would the effect of having, so the, in this case, you looked at fences that are one behind the other, they have the same inter turbine spacing. Yep. Would, by altering the inter turbine spacing, create different local blockers? 
blockages, mm. right? Of, yeah. That's yeah. Would that have? I, I imagine it might have an impact, but. Um, yeah, the, that, the, I think that's a good open question. We don't know the answer. Right. The, yeah. the reason why, I mean, in this type of modelling, then yes, you get more power. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is that this type of modelling, something I didn't probably talk about enough, is that we, we're, when we do that two-scale argument, um, we are assuming that we have quite a lot of turbines in the, uh, in the fence. And if we don't, we do get sort of leakage effects around the sides, which we can't model in this theory. And those leakage effects could be really important if we try to do smaller scale arrangements with only count countable numbers of turbines, um, so that needs to be solved. It's, I, th I think Susanna's cooks looking at that a bit. Okay. Yeah, but but definitely needs to be solved. Um, yeah, so I haven't got anything <laughs> to say. Yeah. Um, I think we're pretty bang on time, so we can just thanks a lot for coming. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.